Yo guys, what is up? Max and our Lords of the Fallen video, and today we're going over everything I wish I knew before getting into this game. This is a Souls-like game, but it is not a From Software Souls-like game, and a lot of things that you think would function similarly uh, function very differently, and so... In this video, I want to talk about a lot of tips, tricks, and things I wish I had known uh, in my 45 hours of playtime that would have saved me a lot of time, uh, allowed me to deal more damage to bosses, uh, and just had a better go at the game. Um, so I hope you find this video informative. This video is going to be spoiler-free. However, at the end of the video, for my very last tip, uh, there is a side quest in this game that can kind of make or break your playthrough. If you make a decision, it can kind of break a lot of things for you. And if you make another decision, you get one of the best items in the game and you can't go back once you make that decision so i just kind of want to talk about what that decision is towards the end of the video but the rest of the video is going to be spoiler free i hope you guys enjoy it let's get right into it so the very first thing i wish i knew so the very first thing i wish i knew about this game before getting into it is how good throwables are now if you come from a from soft souls like dark souls or elden ring uh you kind of know that bows are not very good uh range damage that isn't spell casting is usually not very good that is the opposite of this case in this game so in this game you've got throwables your throwables uh you can throw infinitely and then if you run out you can just go rest at a bonfire or you can use a like uh, ammo pouch to get your throwables back and these throwables do crazy amounts of damage i've beaten entire bosses just throwing hatchets at them um and the range is crazy just to like give you an example here real quick we're just like in the town but if i'm gonna throw this like if there is an enemy over there or like all the way over there like the throwables will genuinely go all the way over there and hit them and they do tons of damage the reason that they do so much damage is because these weapons cannot actually be increased so for example i've got a weapon on that i've got plus 10 on and because it i can upgrade it i can increase its damage the throwables you kind of get them and they're supposed to last you for the whole game uh there are enhanced versions but they get scaling off of your stats. So this hatchet gets scaling off of my strength, meaning the more strength I get in, uh, the more damage it's going to do. And its base attack power is really high because I can't actually increase it any bit more than just increasing my stats. Uh, you've got quick throws with these hatchets uh, and you've got long throws. And when I was playing a strength class and I was playing a pyromancer class to start the game out, my hatchets were dealing way more damage than my fireballs. Um, so throwables are really great and they're really convenient um and if you don't want to use a throwable like a grenade or a knife or something like that you can actually put on a crossbow crossbows you get to pick the bolts that you want to use or bows and you have unlimited ammo you never need to go to a vendor to buy more ammo if you want to shoot more you can rest at a bonfire or use an ammo pouch to get more ammo back um and these things do like a ton of damage um they are they are really really strong um, and so do not sleep on range damage at all. There's a ton of ranged enemies that are going to be a huge annoyance to you. Use your ranged weapons to take them out and then deal with the enemies on the ground. You will thank me later. The next thing that I wish I knew has to do with the different status effects in this game. Now, obviously, status effects are a big part of scaling your damage. Uh, if you played Elden Ring, you know how strong Bleed was. Um, and Bleed and different status effects in this game function very differently. So to start us off, we've got three status effects that are basically in the same group. Bleed is this status effect on your weapon. The next one, the golden one, is going to be Smite. And then the one to the right of Smite is going to be Ignite. Now, all three of these function basically the same way. When you apply bleed to an enemy, if you hit them enough, you're going to build up bleed, and then you're going to get an initial burst of damage when that enemy is bled. It's not a lot of damage. Uh, I was hitting for about 50 bleed damage when I was proccing bleed, and my weapon was hitting for like a 1,000 damage. So just know that bleed, the actual proc of it, was not a lot of damage. However, while they're in the status effect of being bled, any additional hits to your enemies are going to deal additional damage. It's more so of a debuff so that they're going to take additional physical damage from any hits. And Smite works the same way, but it's going to be additional holy damage from any hits. And Ignite is going to apply additional fire damage. So if you're scaling fire damage or holy damage, uh, these are the things that you're going to want. And you basically get to apply them, and then you debuff an enemy, and then all your hits are going to deal additional damage. Now, the, the two actual dot status effects are Burn, which is this top one, and Poison. These are going to build up on an enemy and then deal damage over time. Uh, damage over time in this game is actually very solid. Uh, it carried me for a bunch of boss fights, just igniting bosses all the time. 
And then lastly, uh, this bottom one to the right is going to be Frostbite. Now, Frostbite works the same as Bleed, Smite, and Ignite. However, Frostbite, when it actually procs, you don't deal additional damage. When Frostbite procs, in the enemy that you're fighting is going to get their stamina cut in half and their posture reduced. Uh, so they'll be easier to, like, knock down or stagger. And they will also not be able to move as much or they'll get exhausted sooner. I picture Frostbite being pretty strong in PvP. I don't know how good it's going to be for PvP. Or PvE, sorry. The next thing I wish I knew is how the Umbral World really works. Now, you get a tutorial on the Umbral World when the game starts, but it's not until way later that you really start to, like, get the inner workings of it. So I wanted to quickly break down some things that I wish I knew. So the Umbral World, uh, when you're walking around the normal world, you have a lamp. You can pull that out, and then you can see what the Umbral World looks like, which, by the way, is freaking awesome. Um, and you can go through doors. Uh, you can like go through hidden passageways while just pulling up the lamp. But if you want to interact with anything while you're in the umbral world, you need to fully go into it. Now you can fully go into the umbral world for free. Uh, for me, it's my like LTX button. Now I can't actually leave the umbral world for free. In fact, the only way to actually leave the umbral world is to find a little point that you can leave from. Now, while you're in the Umbral world, you are very vulnerable to dying. The reason for that is, one, none of your potions are going to ever full heal you. You're going to have Wither Bar uh, at the top. You can see that my health bar is basically split into half red, half white. Uh, and this will always go. It'll always, whenever you are low health, max health, you'll always go to split red to split white for all of your health bar. And then in order to get that health back, you actually need to do damage to enemies. And if you get hit, you lose all of that white bar. Uh, your wither bar and some of your health so if one of these enemies hit me i'm going to take a ton of damage as you can see i basically lost all of that health bar where i could have let's say if i heal now um i i've got really good healing potions but now for example if i do damage to this enemy now my health bar is going to be totally full um and so one thing that you should understand while you're in the umbral is one uh you need to be able to recover that health and if you get hit while you have that white bar, you're going to lose way more health than you normally would. So, uh, once again, the throwing items are really important. Uh, whether you're a mage or you're a physical build, uh, just being able to toss a projectile from range safely and fully recover your health, it's almost like using a health potion is, is throwing your weapon while you're in the umbral because you can get that health bag easily without risking getting hit if you jump into melee range. Uh, so that's really good advice for like bossing. Uh, the other thing to understand about the Umbral is the longer that you stay in this world, the more dangerous it gets. And you do not get a revive while you're in the Umbral world. If you die while you're in the normal world, the safe world, you get brought into the Umbral, meaning you basically have two lives, kind of like in Sakura. However, if you die in the Umbral, even if you haven't died in the normal world, if you just move to the Umbral like I just did, if I was to die here, I lose all my souls and I get sent back to the most recent bonfire. Now, the longer you're in the umbral, the more dangerous it gets. As you can see, there's that eye in that like top right. And there's a little like circle that's going to go around it. The more that gets filled, the scarier things get. Once that gets to red, you can no longer heal. You will not be able to heal and they will send out enemies that will delete you. Uh, some really ridiculous enemies. I don't want to show any footage of that. Uh, but you are basically need to get out and, and otherwise you will die. Um, and you can lose all of your souls. However, the incentive for being in the Umbral is the longer you stay here, the actual more souls that you earn. So as you can see, uh, by my like amount of souls or vigor is what it's called in this game. I've got a 1.1 X multiplier. The longer that I stay in here, the more souls that I can farm. Um, so if you are low on souls and need or vigor and you, and you want to get a lot, one of the things that you can do is just go kill enemies while you're in Umbral. You will get more, uh, from killing them while you're here and you'll get significantly more the longer you stay in here. But consequently, they're also going to send more enemies out. So, Hey, if you're like, Oh, I'm like 200 away from getting my next upgrade, you could just pop into the Umbral if, as long as you know that you're not going to die or be safe. Uh, and then you can farm a bunch of things. And then so farming in the Umbral is technically your most efficient way of uh, getting a bunch of souls. And that kind of brings me to my next tip about the Umbral world. Now, like I said previously, when you go into Umbral form, you're brought to the same health status no matter your current health. And you need to be in Umbral form 
to explore a lot of the areas in this game. There are whole sections of this game that you just cannot get to unless you're in umbral form. And so, for example, if you find yourself at low health and you need to go somewhere or explore an area, if I was to use a health potion here, I would be wasting those health potions because I'm going to go into the exact same status that I would if I go into the umbral. So now I was absolutely like low health and now I go into the umbral, hit some enemies, now I'm full health and I'm full HP without having to use a health potion. I kept my seven HP potions and I'm into the umbral where I can explore and then I can find a statue to leave the umbral and then it's like I never lost any health. So now here's an, a statue to emerge. I can just come out of the umbral. I'm full HP and I didn't have to waste any of my health potions. Uh, the areas of this game are long. There's a lot more space between bonfires uh or particularly like the set bonfires than there is in the souls games you have to explore so much further so managing your health uh, is really really important for exploring the game and, and not running out of potions and dying like three or like 10 minutes out from your like last bonfire and that brings me to my last point about the umbral now because you cannot freely swap from umbral form back to non-umbral form uh, everything that you can interact with and explore the world, you can find in the umbral world, meaning that you're not missing any exploration while you're in the umbral form. So if you get to a bonfire, or let's say you go up ahead and you have to run through some enemies and you want to backtrack and like see if you missed anything, do it in the umbral form because there is not any doors, gates, hidden passageways that you will not be able to see in the umbral form that you could see in your physical form. This allows you to efficiently basically check for exploration, hidden doors, hidden objects, just going into the umbral form and staying in there because there's nothing that you could possibly miss while you're in umbral form uh, versus when you're in physical form, you can miss a bunch of things. If you don't like pull up your lantern at the right time or miss like a little clue that there's an umbral area, being in the umbral form is the best way to explore the game because you're going to improve your chances of basically finding all the secrets of the game. The next thing I wish I knew is how genuinely good blocking is. Now, in a lot of games, uh, if you block, you lose a bit of HP, but you don't lose the full amount. You've got like a basically a damage reduction from blocking. In this game, you can't actually lose any HP from blocking. And what I mean by that is all of the hits that you block, you are going to take damage. Uh, you're going to lose some health, but all of that is recoverable. So as you can see, these guys are hitting me. Um, and there I got put in the stun state, but... All of that white part is recoverable. So if I retaliate and I hit one of them, I got hit by a fireball at that same time, but I got all of that HP back from blocking. So blocking is quite safe. Obviously, if you block uh, too much, your stamina is going to break and the enemies can get a hit on you, but you're never actually punished for blocking. So you don't need to be a parry god uh, to basically like be able to stop enemy damage incoming from you. And then you can block and then just hit the enemy. And you, it's like you never lost any health. Uh, so you're not actually punished for blocking. Uh, perfect blocking or parrying is a little bit different, but just know that you can block with any weapon. It doesn't need to be a shield to not have to actually like lose any health. The next thing I wish I knew has to do with leveling up your character. Now, um, if you've played a Souls-like game or a From Software Souls game, this screen probably looks pretty familiar to you, but it functions quite differently than a actual like Souls game. So to start, there isn't a stat that you use to scale your mana. Um, sometimes you'd be picking a mana stat and a damage stat. In this game, your radiance is your holy or like lightning damage. And when you put points into this, you get more mana. Your infernos, your like pyromancy, when you put points into this, you get more mana. So you're consolidating that stat very efficient. You just get more damage and you can cast more spells by putting a single point into like inferno and radiance. So spellcasters are eating good with that. Next up, there's not a stat where you can invest into to increase your encumbrance specifically. Endurance is your stamina. And when you put a point into that, it'll increase your weight. But so does vitality. Every time you put a point into health, you also increase your carrying capacity. So putting points into an endurance and vitality are the only two ways to actually increase your carrying capacity besides like putting on rings and amulets. Um, next up are soft caps and hard caps. Now a soft cap is where you're starting to get diminishing returns from your investment into your stats, meaning you might be getting five damage every stat point you put, but at, when you hit your soft cap, now you're gonna be only getting three points of damage. And then once you hit a hard cap, points beyond that point uh, are basically giving you barely nothing or nothing at all uh, where they're just not inve worth investing into anymore. Now your soft caps for your damage scaling stats 
are going to be uh, 40. Uh, so that is like Strength, Agility, Radiance, and Inferno. And then the hard camps for your damage stats are going to be 75, meaning anything past 75, you're not going to benefit from them. For our Endurance and Vitality, their 40 is going to be the soft cap. So you want to get to like 40 Vitality, and then the hard cap is going to be 60. The one thing that's really interesting about this uh, that can be a bit confusing is it actually stops displaying your damage increases once you hit soft cap. Um, so here, like this is my strength stat, for example. Uh, if I put a point into strength, I'm not actually increasing my attack power on anything. Note that my hatchet, my ammunition, scales off of my strength and my agility, but it's not actually going to get any more damage from it. However, uh, if I put a point into agility, it's actually going to show me more damage. Now, this isn't actually correct. Uh, if I put a point into strength, I will actually get more damage from my weapons, uh, that scale strength. It's just because we've already hit that cap, it displays as me not getting any more damage, but you will. So real quick, just to test of this, as you saw in my like scaling screen, I wasn't actually getting any more damage increases from more strength. Um, but for example, my hatchet currently scales off of strength. And if I throw it and let's hit that enemy, uh, I do a 540 hit. 540 hit without my strength ring on take the strength ring off and now we're gonna deal 531 um so even though i've only increased my strength uh, or change in loss strength and it shows that i'm not actually gaining any damage by investing more in strength uh you you are gaining more uh so i know that that was confusing and i actually stopped specking into strength uh because i thought it was hard capped at like 40 um but that is just not the case uh you can go up to 75 on your strength scaling and still be genuinely benefiting from it uh there does seem to be a little bit of a dead zone around the 57 mark where you're not going to be seeing much damage uh 57 mark there's just for some reason a dead zone uh but then past that you're gonna keep seeing that scaling uh so on this enemy let's do an r1 that was an 891 hit uh let's put on that ring and then uh that was a different attack because i was moving one second there's a 911 so as you can see um just you keep scaling up your strength up even to 75 uh, even though the game won't display you're getting more damage the next thing i wish i knew has to do with like the dual wield and like weapon combo system so right now i am one handing this weapon and if i attack with it i'm gonna do 809 damage on my like overhead swing 809 damage as you can see if i two hand the weapon and now do the exact same attack now i do 947 um so i'm dealing additional damage just by two-handing the weapon uh this is to incentivize you to like two-hand things so if, if you do have a, have a weapon and you start two-handing it you are going to get a damage increase which does make a lot of sense um however you also lose some of that damage when you start to dual wield it so let's do a like uh let's do just do a uh hold r2 charge we'll do it with one hand or just to show you guys real quick so let's get a enemy dear r two-hander smack that was one uh uh one six one nine let's just put on a broken sword we'll do our like one-hander hold down attack again and then that was 1599 um so if you are dual wielding um this is just kind of a point i wanted to make if you're gonna dual wield and you're using a weapon that's upgraded you're gonna want to make sure that your other weapon is also upgraded to to make up for the damage loss that dual wielding is going to inherently give you if you have two weapons that are upgraded uh and they're upgraded a bunch uh or equal amounts you will get more damage but if you're using one weapon that's fully upgraded and one weapon that isn't upgraded um you're gonna do more damage if you are one-handing that weapon without a dual wield or more damage if you're two-handing it you do deal a little bit less damage uh it seems if you are dual wielding versus if you are um using double weapons and obviously that's just if you are using a weapon that is like a, of lower level or a not upgraded so dual wielding is very cool in this game just make sure that if you are going to be dual wielding you're going to be upgrading your weapons uh relatively equally uh so that you can keep up your damage don't just invest into one and not invest into the other 
The very last thing I wish I'd known does get into a bit of, like, spoiler. Uh, it's not spoiler for, like, the main plot or any of the bosses or anything like that. Uh, you just have a side quest with one of the NPCs that actually has a drastic effect on the rest of the game um, and can kind of break your playthrough a bit. So if you're done watching the video, that is all the tips. If you don't want any spoilers, uh, you can click off the video safely now. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you are interested in this, I do want to explain it because it can really alter your playthrough. Um, and so having the, to make the right decision and not hurt your playthrough uh, can be really, really helpful. So sp spoiler warning, there is a side quest that you're going to get for this blacksmith lady. The blacksmith is going to ask you to go get runes. You're going to get three runes. You're going to bring them back to her. Um, and every time you give her a rune, she's going to upgrade her store or upgrade her crafting abilities so that you can modify your weapons and fine tune them more to fit your build. Now, she also has a servant or a kind of like enslaved uh, servant named Sparky. And Sparky wants these runes as well. And the very last rune you can either give to Sparky and set him free, or you can give to the blacksmith lady. You are going to want to, in my opinion, give it to the blacksmith lady. However, the first option, if you're just clicking through the dialogue, the very first option is to give it to Sparky. Now, if you give the last rune to Sparky, um, all of Gerlin's shop items are going to double in price. Um, and she sells... Delirium shards. These are the shards that you upgrade your weapons with. So if you want to get a weapon to a plus five, plus six, plus seven, plus eight, you have to buy these from her. And if you want to experiment with multiple weapons, there's a limited amount of these in the game. So you have to buy them. And them permanently doubling for the rest of your time in the game, uh, the cost of them is really rough. Uh, you're going to be really starved for resources if you want to try out new builds and new weapons um and so these costs will double if you give the rune to sparky however you get the ability to modify your weapons at bonfires so if you wanted to unsocket a rune on your weapon if you were out in the world you could go to a bonfire and change the rune out uh there's not really any reason to ever be like hot swapping your runes out once you put them in you're probably pretty good forever unless you get a better rune to drop but you can just teleport back here so i don't think it's that big of a deal if you give the rune to gerlind you do not get the ability to upgrade your weapons at bonfires however she keeps all of her uh inventory at the same price it doesn't get lower it's the same price um which is a great price in my opinion you can get these like end game shards for 1500 and you also get a special rune from her now the only way to get this rune is by turning in the rune to her uh the book and it's called Crafter's Essence. This reads, ignore weight and stat requirements on the slighted, uh, sl uh, slotted item. Weapon function lowers a weapon's weight and stat requirements to zero. Uh, the reason this is so good is because if you've got a weapon that you want to use that's got some agility scaling and you don't want to put points into agility, or it's got some inferno scaling, you don't want to put points into inferno, you can slap this on and then ignore the stat requirements and set it to zero. This is so good for dual wielding. Uh, because there's not like a massive way to improve your um, your weight in this game and your carrying capacity, I can now, I'm using this sword of skin and tooth. This is 41 weight out of my total, like 100 and something weight. So a lot of this is being taken up by this sword. And if I wanted to use a dual wield weapon with this, for example, the Wayfarer's Hammer, which is another massive weapon, um, I can slot this rune on this thing. And then the strength requirements are zero. And more importantly, the weight requirements of my hammer are now zero. So I could basically dual wield for free with zero penalties uh, and just have this hammer on my back. And then I can do my like attacks. And then if I want to pull out the hammer, then I get my dual wield attacks. Um, and I'm not sacrificing my like weight or having to change my armor or anything about my build to be able to dual wield two massive weapons. Um, so in my opinion, obviously you can do whatever you want. Uh, I would turn the rune into her um, and then you can craft and build more weapons up and you also get a cool one to add a lot more like cool stuff to dual wielding. So that's just my uh, personal preference for that. Uh, but I wanted you guys to know that because if you make the wrong decision and you didn't know, I personally would be pretty frustrated with that. Guys, that is going to do it for the video. I hope you enjoyed. If you got through all 25 minutes of this video, uh, let me know. I'm actually very curious uh, how many people will make it through this long of a video. I don't usually post videos this long. Um, and share it with a friend if you found it helpful. Uh, these were some of the things that I wish I had known, and now you should know them. And uh, I wish you the best of luck with your experience playing Lords of the Fallen. Uh, this game is gorgeous. It's really fun. Uh, and there's so much to explore. 
but uh, I, the performance on it is genuinely some of the worst uh, of a video game that I've played this year. So I really do hope that they fix their performance and maybe there'll be like a day one patch uh, that I don't know about why, by the time that I'm recording this. But yeah, good game, just bad performance. And yeah, guys, I'll catch you all in the next one. Take care. Peace.